the Dowager Queen, Fenway Park, without a hair out of place. And at least for tonight, she goes to the ball like a young lady once again as the Red Sox take the field. The first ball ceremony, the Honorable Thomas P. Tip O'Neill, Jr., retiring after spending for 34 years in the U.S. House of Representatives as a congressman from Massachusetts, and he has been Speaker of the House for the last 10 years, throwing out the first ball to Rich Gedman. Here's the defense for the Red Sox, and all you've been hearing, and we asked the fellow, Rice will be in left field. The wall will be his primary responsibility. Henderson in center field. Evans in right field, as always. Strong arm. Boggs at third base. Oh, and the shortstop, he's a key man, because with all these angles, especially right behind third base, he'll be going out on any ball hit the left field. Barrett's at second base. Buckner at first base. Gedman behind the plate, and oil can Boyd on the mound. Dennis Boyd. The oil can 16 and 10. He was 9 and 6 here at Fenway Park during the year. And as you probably know, if you followed the game at all, extremely high strung. In fact, they tell us that John McNamara even has a signal from the bench telling the can to cool it. He didn't throw as hard this year as he did last year. The key to his success is if he keeps the ball down. And among other things, with a good straight change and a curve, he also has a screwball, but it wouldn't really be called so much of a screwball as, let's say, he turns over the chain. He's got six pitches, really, Ben. Uh, fastball, curve, slider, screwball, it turns it over. He's got the straight change. He can sink his fastball, and he rides it. Uh, Bill Fisher says that he's got great natural ability, and he just doesn't go to one particular pitch when he's in trouble. He goes against some of the pitching basics because he rocks, but uh, nobody's going to change him the way he's pitching. And, of course, he's got that thing that Satchel Page always called the yellow hammer, which is the overhand curveball, and that's a good out pitch for him. He's built like the the hour hand on your watch, and when he went to spring training in March, he checked in at 133 pounds. Well, they made tests on his liver, found he had non-contagious hepatitis, and he has puffed up now to 156. The can spent last night with his in-laws in East Providence, Rhode Island, 43 miles away from Boston. There you see that overhand curveball that he throws, and he comes right over the top. He's got a little bit of a hesitation pitch in there. I tell you, he is a big Satchel Paige uh, admirer, and one of the things I love, he said, some of the advice that Satch gave me, he said, keep the pitch in the strike zone, but away from the bat. One other thing about Oil Can Boyd, as we take a look at his delivery, you'll notice when he was interviewed on the pregame show, he was wearing glasses. But when he pitches, he does not wear glasses, nor does he wear contact lenses. I asked Rich Getman about that, if he does anything special as far as the signs. He says, no, I don't like to do that. And he will cross me up a few times, even tonight. Well, Ken said that he remembers pitching in a minor league game where he crossed up the catcher 30 times in 80 pitches because he couldn't see the signs, misinterpreted them. However, I guess that's a, another good way of keeping the hitters loose. And the catcher. <laughs> and the umpire. And, and the vendors. Vendors. And the bar. Well, here's Lenny Dykstra, followed by Wally Backman and then Keith Hernandez. And here we go. Wade Boggs playing up inside the bag on the edge of the grass. And the can is ready. Ball one. Sitting up here, and it might not be quite as obvious on our screens but the infield grass is cut almost in concentric circles it looked like the mound was a pond and it had received a pebble one and one there you can see some of the tracks whether that will influence a ball or not remains to be seen I talked to Joe Mooney about that Vin. he says it's just the uh, tires on the mower but that long third base there are some ridges and Dykstra and Backman really have to keep it going as far as getting the Mets started one ball one strike drive down the right field line hooking in the corner if it's fair it's gone it's gone Lenny Dykstra takes oil can deep and the Mets lead one to nothing that's the kind of thing a ball club needs to get picked up they jump out one man one run and that whole ball club you can see that Met bench is waiting for him 
was the first extra base hit by the Mets in the World Series. So Dykstra gets the Mets out in front one to nothing. And Wally Backman always a threat to bunt particularly with Buckman on that bad leg over at first base. Barrett has shortened up at second base. He'll be trying to protect him as much as he can because he'll try to drag it past oil can and oil can just pointed to Boggs be alive. Ball one one and oh. Lenny Dykstra convinced now that it's in the seats officially. One ball and no strikes. The plate umpire is Harry Wendelstead of the National League. Then you have Brinkman, Montague, and Ford with Kibler and Evans on the line. Backman followed by Keith Hernandez. Two balls and one strike. That home run by Dykstra is the first time the Mets have been ahead in this series. Mm -hmm. And it took a little muscle from an unexpected quarter to provide us with the situation. Two balls and one strike. Ball three, and he's in dangerous territory pitching high. We have a quick chance to look at the dimensions of the ballpark and some of the angles. 315 down the line. There's the monster, 37 feet high with a 23 foot screen atop it, falling away to 379. The deepest part is 420, the triangle, the V. 380 to straight away right, and then right down the right field line. We're in one. So Backman goes all the way. A beautiful evening here in New England. Temperature, I guess, around 60. And there's a line drive base hit into right field. Sounded like the bat cracked at least. It didn't break, but Backman singles, and the batter now will be Keith Hernandez. It's a fastball. He just pulls it in the right field. And oil can kind of regrouping as he walks around the mound. Two batters, two base hits. Run by Dykstra, single to right by Wally Backman, and now that brings up Keith Hernandez, a 310 hitter who was 33 yesterday. Hernandez with Gary Carter to follow. That bat did split. I just saw Gedman go out and take some of the bat to the kind of split a name on the fat part, the barrel yeah, of the bat. I could hear it. It sounded like that old song Celery Stalks at midnight. a year for him winning his 16 if you remember he was suspended July 10th hospitalized July 17th returned to the team on August 1st and apparently his displeasure over the fact he was not selected for the all star team and it is interesting to think that because the Red Sox have won the American League pennant who do you think will select the pitchers for the 1987 All-Star Game for the American League? <laughs> you got it, John McNamara. Boyd has fallen behind every hitter. One and zero. Pretty good fastball. That's about as hard as he can throw right there. You would think the Mets, even though they want to get something started with Backman, are going to give Hernandez at least a chance to try to pull that ball. And although he's taking a good look now at Buddy Harrelson. One ball and one strike. The count to Keith Hernandez. Time call for the moment. As Backman trying to clear off the runway off first base. Might be a bit soft there. The Red Sox do not have a whole lot of speed. You certainly wouldn't want to make it a fast track for them as we look at Dykstra and Kevin Mitchell, but maybe make it a little bit soft and slow it down for the Mets. One ball and one strike, Akeem. The can 
has a high set. He doesn't set around the belt buckle. That set, his hands were together up around the letters. And then he was trying to fool Backman with his head. When he goes set, there's not much to hide behind. And they pitch out that time. And Backman still holding, and the count two balls and one strike. We're just warming up. First inning, Len Dykstra homered, Wally Backman singled, and the batter is Keith Hernandez. One nothing Mets. field and hit it hard once back when at first base saw Rice have to go over to the left center field there was no way he was going to stop at second base because he knew he had an easy way to get to third. Bill Fisher talking to his manager and now John coming out. So McNamara going out to discuss with oil can just what's going on. He has thrown one pitch that you might say he threw hard and that was that strike to Keith Hernandez There has not been any stuff at all otherwise and he's been dangerous because he's been up and his strength is down. He's relied mostly on that fastball and he has fallen behind the hitters and I'm sure he's saying fine I feel OK I just don't know what's happening. You know it's interesting too. Everyone has gone back to the history books talking about Kansas City losing the first two games and coming back. If you remember the third game last year was pitched by another colorful character, Joaquin Andujar. Game six was a rough start for Oil Can. Remember he settled down, so maybe that's what John McNamara is looking for, but he's got to get ahead of these hitters or he's going to be having line drives hit off him all night long, or at least as long as he stays out there. Keith Hernandez standing at first, Wally Backman down the line from third, and here is Gary Carter. Carter, as we have talked about, has been hitting a lot of balls up the middle. They try to shade him that way. He got himself into a dreadful slump in the Houston series. One reason being he was trying to pull everything, and in taking his stride into the pitch, he was landing on his heel. That opened him up, and his head would bounce, and he was really losing the outside pitch completely. hit into the wall. Backman will score. Hernandez to third and Carter into second with a double and the can is leaking in the first inning. So Gary Carter on a team that did not have an extra base hit in the first two games. They produce a home run and a double in the first inning. And now with first base open, Daryl Strawberry will be the batter. Sammy Stewart is the long man. He's first up. There he is in an area that is will forever be called Williamsburg. That bullpen was established in 1940 when the kid came here, Ted Williams. Carter's ball is well hit. Nothing fluky about it. It's in the gap. 
Henderson plays it off the wall. So now Strawberry, who has had such a bad time, he has struck out 16 times in eight postseason games with a chance to get well and get well in a hurry. First base open. On the corner. Hernandez at third. Carter at second. And nobody out in the first inning. Strawberry, the fifth man to come to the plate. Put on an absolutely awesome show in batting practice. But that was batting practice. Two good fastballs, one on the outside part of the plate and one on high. Had something on it. Carter trying to tell him to keep get that ball down, get a strike to hit. No balls and two strikes. Interesting. No, uh, no breaking balls. No off-speed pitches. Another fastball. This is the pitch that he's been taking low inside, but it's out of the strike zone. Good pitch with two strikes. He can work on it. One and two to Darrell. Out on. On deck, Ray Knight. The Mets have scored twice on a home run, two singles, and a double. They have runners at second and third, nobody out, and a hungry hitter at the plate. Bow back. The Red Sox have been a hot ball club. Remember, they come into this game having won five straight. John McNamara seeing his team come from 3 1 down to win the LCS. Davy Johnson's club had to scramble to get here after having won 108. In the dirt. The Mets trying to come back, and they're leading here in the first inning 2 to nothing. Two and two to Strawberry. Ball three. Looked like he tried to turn that over. It tried to get him with a screwgee on the corner, but it danced away. Take another look at it. You can see Getman try to frame it, keeping that glove in his strike zone, but she drifts outside and he holds it there. But Harry Wendelstead says, nope, outside. Three and two to Darrell Strawberry. Second and third, nobody out. Sometimes with our center field shot, you wonder how you can make sure a pitcher can see you. You do it with flaps and sometimes use your fingers as decoys, and then you count the number of times he may pat one leg or the other, and that's what you make up before the game. Let's see if he does it. There it is, right there. Oh, and one. Ground ball wide at third. Box has a play at the plate. They've got Hernandez and Carter, and Bods will throw to third, and they'll now go after Carter. Now looks at third. He's going to lose the play. Everybody's safe. Oh, did they mess it up? I think that Getman was the key to that play. There were two men at third base. Carter and Hernandez were going back, and Getman gave the ball to Box, and Box realized two men were on. You'll watch it here. Now 
The box makes the play, sizes it up perfectly. Now they've got him hung up. Now Getman hasn't hung up. Hernandez going back. He just runs him back. He's all right because Carter was right there. You can see that Owen starts to chase him back. And here's where they lose it. Right now, you ask for the salt and pepper to take a bite out of it. I tell you, year in, year out, day in and day out, the biggest disappointment I think you get in watching big league teams, how often they mess up a rundown play. It's a simple fielder's choice, no error involved. Base is loaded, one out on a monumental break, and here is Danny Heap for a strike. This is where your pitcher really has to pick up the ball club and he's going to try for the strikeout. If nothing else is say, hey guys, let's all settle down and begin with me. 0 and 1 to Danny Heap. Hernandez, Carter, and Knight all out on the line. And there's a line drive base hit. That was an expensive mess up by the Red Sox. Carter will score with Hernandez. It is 4 to nothing, New York. Danny Heap, the designated hitter, lines to Santa to drive in two, and the Mets have gotten the drop on the Red Sox. It's pretty obvious that even though they didn't work out yesterday and they thought the rest were doing good, the Mets would come out really charging. So a home run, two singles, a double, a bad defensive play, and another base hit, and the Mets have four. Two on, still only one out, and Mookie Wilson hitting left-handed at the plate. Strike. The most emotion shown in the Mets dugout since the series started. Understandably, they got nothing in the first game, and they were blown out in the second. Second, Ray Knight. One out and four runs in the bank. sequence he shook Gedman off two pitches to make sure he came back to the fastball and you can see how high strong and hyper oil can is he really took that upon himself to say I'm just gonna blow it right by him years ago up here they had the battle cry spawn and sane and two days of rain earlier this year the battle cry in Boston was Clemens and Boyd and fill the void there has been a sizable gap but their pitching has improved dramatically but they're down by four in the first inning. Strike one to Rafael Santana, the ninth man to come to the plate in the first inning. Sammy Stewart is long since ready. If they need him, he's just a spectator in the bullpen. Ground ball, speared by Box, the short way to Barrett, and they get the force on Danny Heath. Four runs, five hits, and a downcast boy leaving the field, trailing four to nothing. play that really hurt him in that inning. Getman has the ball. Hernandez is hung up. Now Getman's running him back. And right here, if he keeps running him back, you'll notice it's cut off, but there's there is uh, Carter at the third base, two men, and now Spike Owen has the ball, and he's going to lose the play by looking, double clutching, and he's in no man's land. If Getman runs him back, he's got a, a whole welcoming committee of Mets there, and you tag everybody, including the third base coach, if you have to, and one of them's going to be out. Had Getman just held on to the ball, and the Mets would have had two runners at third base. Rich would have tagged both probably instinctively and the runner who would have been out would be Carter third base belonged to the runner occupying it at the time and that would be Keith Hernandez. Here's the uh, defense for the Mets Mookie Wilson in left field Dykstra who got him off and running in center field Strawberry Knight to third Santana Backman Hernandez Carter behind the plate and Ojeda four run lead for Ojeda. 
Bobby Ojeda is setting a little World Series history. He's the first pitcher in the World Series to start a game against the club for which he played the previous year. And Bobby Ojeda is accustomed to being in the history books. He was the winning pitcher in the longest professional baseball game ever played. We'll see if it's a long or short night for him. Ball one to Wade Bond. He's got a fastball, curveball, slider, change up. He has to change speeds and importance fastball and change. One ball and no strikes. Bouncer and a comebacker. And Ojeda just lobs it to Hernandez. One away. Rather than send you to the history books, it was a triple-A game between Pawtucket and Rochester. It went 33 innings. They played 32 innings on April the 18th. Then they had to play the 33rd inning on June 23rd. The game officially took eight hours and 25 minutes, and Ojeda got the win. Here's Marty Barrett. One away, bottom of the first. The Red Sox have been a first inning ball club offensively all year. They've done more damage in the first inning than any other time in a game. Right. Ojeda, when he pitched here, had a lifetime record at Fenway of 20 and 17. He was 4 and 7 at Fenway last year. Ground ball backhanded by Ojeda. Just like that, he handles two of them. So two out in the first inning on comeback. There's that second place a dandy. Much like uh, the home run takes the air out of the momentum when uh, you come back with it. If Ojeda can get him one, two, three, and as easily as it looks, and he just backhands this one, it's going to really take the air out of the balloon. And Bill Buckner coming up, two down in the first inning, four to nothing in favor of the Mets. Buck hobbling but playing every inning just about. And Harry Wendelstead gesturing, I believe, to take a sign off the center field wall. That's what it was. Billy Bucks hit 18 home runs during the year and 102 RBI. And he's been inspirational playing and playing well on that bad leg. As we mentioned, with all of his leg and ankle problems, he only missed eight games all year. One and one. Account to Bill Buckner, two out in the first inning. The Mets leading four nothing. Strawberry coming over. It's playable. He's got it. So Buckner a fly ball to right. The Sox are gone in the first inning. And Ojeda's back at home at the end of an inning. 4 0 New York. We're going to the second inning. Nine men came to the plate in the first inning for the Mets. And the spark plug, Len Dykstra, led off with a home run, which is not exactly like news that. for him. No, he had lead off home runs off Danny Cox, Kevin Gross, and Mike Maddox. And then I'll tell you something. I'm sure that Gedman has said the Boggs and both and even Buckner and Barrett be alive for the bunt the home run forget about it. Yeah he did hit it but he wants to get something started. He can do a lot of things in the batter's box. So oil can ready to go in second round. Strike. No balls in one strike. In there. Strike two. For the can who struck out two in the first inning, his high this year, he struck out ten in Texas. Oh and two. Well, one. One and two. Last year, Oil Can had two games where he struck out twelve, and he did that back to back. So he can blow you away. One and two to Dykstra. Little ground ball to the right side. Marty Barrett to Bill Buckner. 
to Lenny Dykstra. Takes okay. the elevator from the penthouse to the basement. One out, and Wally Backman coming Wally Backman. up, and we pause briefly for station Wally identification. Backman. This is the NBC Television Network. Wally Backman coming up with the Mets leading four to nothing in the second. That was the first real good breaking ball that uh, Oil can through to get Dykstra. He's been relying on the fastball. Ball one, one and zero. Oh. There is a feeling around that since the can is not throwing as hard this year as last year, the screwball might be taking something away from him, and the slider has not been as sharp as it was last year. Out off, one ball, one strike. Davey Johnson trying to get his ball club well on foreign soil down two games to none. He has seen them at least jump out in front four to nothing. And remember they did not work out here yesterday. In there. Good pick. I get the feeling uh, before the game that one of the big reasons he didn't want all his players subjected to all the negative questions of what are you going to do now that you're two down just keep him away from that he felt probably that was more important than batting practice after that long game Sunday night the Red Sox flew home a lot of the Mets were still in uniform at one o'clock in the morning. Come right over the top, and you can see it roll down. That was the first one he threw. Well, that's his third strikeout as we take another look at that rainbow. Now, watch his arm just come right over the top, and she just drops right down. Sometimes, occasionally during the course of a long year, he'll throw that curveball a little too slow. But boy, not that time. And Keith Hernandez, who's singled in the first inning, coming up. So, boy, trying to do an about face. with Carter on deck. In there. Like he turned that over. Gary Carter waiting his turn. They each contributed five hits and four runs in the first. Tried to pull an outside pitch and grounds it to Buckner, who hangs it to Boyd, who did a little toe dance and hit the bag. So Hernandez, who likes to go the other way, hit a pull on an outside pitch and rolled out. It's anybody who's gone away from a place where they grew up in a sense and I grew up in the game here in Boston in a sense and comes back and comes back uh, after having some success uh, it's a good feeling and I enjoyed my time here I enjoyed the years I spent growing up here and coming back here uh, part of me is still here without a doubt because I left some I left some blood here and some tears here as dramatic as that sounds and uh, I grew up here and, and uh, but I am you know, uh, I belong elsewhere now, but I enjoyed my time here. Well, he will face a former teammate, Jim Rice, and misses away. Ojeda was not drafted by the Red Sox. He was signed as a free agent back in 78. One ball, no strikes. Two and up. I think this is his first test, Vin, and it's going to show us if he's going to be pitching inside to move these big guys off, like Rice and Baylor, who, if you do make a mistake outside, they're strong enough to pull it against that wall and play wall ball. 2 and 0. Oh. Slicing foul down the right field line out of play, and the count 2 and 1. One thing that wall does, you cannot win with medium stuff as a pitcher here because it you can hit mistakes and hit them against that wall. And with guys like Rice and Baylor, they're in scoring position when they walk in the batter's box. Interesting for the Mets to score four runs and five hits in the first inning, and the wall didn't figure at all. Two balls, one strike. Ball three. Came inside. He's going he's to have to establish that. Three balls, one strike. On the corner. So high and in, then he works on the outside corner and goes three and two. Both catchers really checking these peakers in this ballpark. 
Gedman and Carter looking right up at him. Rantu fouled away. Rice will be followed by Baylor and Evans, the number four hitter in the inning. Bobby Ojeda's best friend on the ball club, Rich Gedman. Ojeda, you might remember in game two of the LCS against Houston, made a big play to tag Kevin Bass at the plate. He was all over the place in that game. This is just as big, if not bigger. Right on the outside corner. And Rice is caught looking. 25. He wasn't sure of that pitch at all, but it doesn't make a difference how sure or unsure. It was called a strike. Baylor. So you'll be the umpire. One thing the Sox, I'm sure, are well aware of the fact he'll throw that change at any time, especially when he's behind. Here's Baylor. Ball one, one and oh. Baylor right on top of that plate. His arms are almost in the strike zone or over that plate. Look how close he is. He wants you to come inside. Carter chucking all over. Fouled away. Baylor, the only Red Sox to have at least one hit in all seven league championship series games. Baylor, all told, is hit in 10 straight. who was the designated sitter in New York now gets a chance to rough up a former teammate. He played with Davey Johnson in Baltimore. Fifteen years he has waited for this moment and he's in the World Series. That was interesting. That was a new ball he put in play after following it off and Baylor wanted to check it before he even threw it. Maybe the pollution is greater than I think. One ball and one strike. Well two. Turn one. Usually pitchers like to pitch away from Baylor particularly here in Fenway and throw him a lot of off speed pitches Rice is still ticked off about that strike three call two and one ball three so he went three and two to Rice and got him and he comes back three and one to Baylor it's very difficult as we look at David Johnson to pitch Baylor any place but away and if you don't have the real good spot well, he can flick that bat and play wall ball with you. Pitchers couldn't hit any of them. I mean, it sounds nice, but I don't believe it. Well, let's see about the battle. Big slow jug, and he missed with it. Ball one, one and zero. Oh. The one thing that it does, though, if you've caught a fella, is you know what he likes to go to in a particular spot. But then again, you have to think, well, he knows that too. So here goes that cat and mouse game. Remember, Gedman is that unusual left-hand hitter who is a high ball hitter. Baylor at second, two out in the second inning, four to nothing Mets. For Baylor to hit the wall for a double, that's old hat here. The Sox led the majors with doubles. One and oh. He got it high. Gedman went after it, fouled it back. One and one. You can see why he would like that ball better 
up than down because of that swing. Again, it's that Reniac watch now. He'll let that top hand go off and he swings down on the ball. Now his home run production will go down with that, but he'll get more base hits according to the theory. One and one, the count of Gedman. Baylor waiting to be picked up at second base. Big, slow, and it missed. Ball two, two and one. Back with a pretty much of his best fastball on the count two and two. Ojeda handled a couple of comebackers in the first inning, struck out a batter in the second, and of course that's a key. A 3-2 pitch that was eyeballed by Harry Wendelstead for strike three of its ball four. Baylor's double really puts the Sox in business. Dead Rice called out, so Baylor's at second and no runs in. Deuce is wild on Gedman. The fastball. So he strikes out two. The Sox leave Baylor. It's four to nothing Mets. And we'll be right back after these messages from your local station. Tonight's game is brought to you by Newprin. Discover Newprin strength. By Wendy's, now introducing the big classic hamburger. This is the good stuff. Four to nothing in favor of the Mets as we go to the third inning. Gary Carter, Darrell Strawberry, and Ray Knight against Oil Can Boyd. Strike. Oh, and one. Looked like Gedman was searching for Oil Can's curveball, and they seem to have found it. Another good one. Oh, and one to Carter. Who cracks his bat and lifts a fly ball to shallow center, and Henderson is there. And you could hear that thing crack. Carter doubled, you remember, in the first inning. So one away, and Strawberry coming up. John McNamara is complaining about Ojeda going to his mouth, spitting in his hand. Uh, doesn't like that at all. All I'm doing is I'm asking. Cross my heart, I saw him do it. Can't remember the two games in New York? He was good. And with the cold weather, they were allowed to do it. I don't think that there was any provision for that tonight about because the weather is really almost balmy. Oh, and one. What I meant was with Gooden taking a band aid off his uh, finger, it wasn't even his uh, pitching hand, but uh, anything to upset a pitcher. Well, here's Strawberry. It looks like he inherits an 0 2 count. Ball oh, one. I'm sure you get to that point after a while where you walk up to the plate and you think is it already 0 and 2. Well I tell you he's in one of those things you're confused and you're getting all kinds of advice. Fastball hit down the left field line starting to curl foul and well out of play. When it's considered a slump you go to your batting coach in the old age old baseball thing a slump is like the common cold it's going to last two weeks regardless of what you do but the toughest thing is just to be able to discard all the friendly advice you get on your way to the batter's box one and two well, he got out in front of that fastball and pulled it into the Sox dugout so he got the pitch he wanted and went out in front of it you're not hitting you have really no good idea of the strike zone and that ball was low inside out of the zone Hits that one to right center. Henderson, however, is there. So two down, top of the third, and the batter will be Ray Knight. The Mets had a home run by Lenny Dykstra. That started them off in the right direction. They had four more hits, including a double by Carter. The Sox messed up a rundown play, and the Mets put four in the bank. The Sox had a one out double by Baylor after a key strikeout call against Rice opened up the second inning. And we're now in the third. Ball one. That was interesting. We saw Gedman give the sign. He gave the sign, shook him off, came back, and then he indicated overhand curveball. I've never seen a sign given like that. It was just rolled his wrist. One and oh. Fouled off first down the line and out of play. 
Next strike. It was Ray Knight who hit the ground ball to Wade Boggs. The Sox had a golden opportunity and they were unable to get an out. Popped it up on the right side. Barrett going out looking for a little help. Evans comes along behind him and it'll be Barrett anyway. So the Mets are out in order for the second time. That's eight in a row retired by the can, but it's 4 nothing New York. Bobby Ojeda going to work in the bottom of the third. The Mets leading the Sox 4 to nothing. It'll be Dave Henderson, Spike Owen, and then Wade Boggs. Speed pitch off and it really danced away. One ball and no strikes. Fouled away. The Sox know how good a pitcher Bobby Ojeda can be. Remember two years ago when the Detroit Tigers ran away? They were 35 and 5 at the start of the year. One of the five defeats that Detroit suffered, one to nothing at the hands of Bobby Ojeda, who was then wearing a Sox uniform. He struck out 10. Line the left field base hit. Mookie over to backhand the ball, and Henderson holding, and the throw comes all the way through to Wally Backman. Establish inside here, but if you miss your target, the wall makes you pay a big price. Here's Ojeda to Rice inside to Baylor inside. Now, watch Baylor flick it when he got it just out over the plate, and the wall says, Hey, cash me in. Two base hit, and now Henderson just drills one to left. So the batter is on with Henderson at first and nobody out, and Wade Boggs on deck. Third inning, 4 0 New York. Change and he missed with it. In fact, Carter whirling on Wendelstead. One ball and no strikes. I tell you, if he had ideas of bunt, that would have been the perfect pitch because second baseman Batman has to cheat towards the bag. That if he pushes it past Ojeda, who is a pretty good fielder, as indicated already, uh, he's, that's the guy he gets a buy and it's a base hit. And he had a good pitch, the off speed pitch. One ball and no strikes to Spike. First base that he thinks Riniac may be stealing some signs. I mean, I shot from center field. He's looking all over the place. There he goes again down first base, and Walt is out of the coach's box. Henderson held on at first by Keith Hernandez. In there. That time you saw him, he looked up at Spike Owen and he looked at first base. He's checking around. He's, he's just checking his whole ballpark and, and, and including the hitter. Walt Reniak coaching at first, Rene Latchman over at third. There's the pride of Natick, Massachusetts, Walt Reniak. Two and one. In there again, two and two. A maddening pitcher is Bobby Ojeda. Changing speeds, that's the thing he does so well. And I tell you, when he establishes that fastball inside and then changes speeds, it, it could be like three pitches. His move to first is rated slow from and from the plate, very slow. So he's borderline average trying to throw to first. We haven't seen him go over there. Check swing, a looper tonight. Back to first, not in time. The Owen lines to third, one away, and the batter will be Wade Boggs. Wade Boggs, who tries to put in his mind a pitcher in the American League with similar heater, names Charlie Liebrand as the guy. And his target would be from the speakers in center field to the left field line. Low with that big gap in first between first and second. Look out. Remember, he hit back to the box in the first inning. Ball one, one and all. Interesting about the Sox, they won 51 games at home this year, but they only hit 55 home runs at home. This is a whole new Boston edition. Ball two. Two and auto bonds. Four nothing New York, bottom of the third, one away. Missed it. 
again. But behind 3 and 0, oh, that means Marty Barrett on deck becomes potentially the tying run. And of course, at Fenway Park, or make it almost a tying run in the dugout, would be Bill Buckner. They get you back in the game in a hurry here. That's a strike. Grand one. Boggs, who led the majors in walks, has to count his way. simply trying to do is to settle him down and say hey once again can't make a play if you don't give us a chance and it's not as if it was let's say an American League umpire who was unaccustomed to calling balls and strikes with Ojeda Harry Wendelstead is in the National League one ball and no strikes to Marty Barrett in there one and one two on you have Henderson at second Boggs at first and Barrett at the plate. Buckner on deck. One away. There's the change. Hit to the hole into right field. Base hit. They're sending Henderson home. Strawberry's throw not in time. some extra hitting and he was trying to hit the ball from center field over although they are playing him straight away. Remember he hit an off speed pitch Sunday night for a base hit to right field. Part of the book on Buck is to throw a lot of slow stuff. He has a tendency to ground the ball. That's one reason along with his bad wheels why he led the major leagues. In fact he was second in grounding into double plays. Fast ball hit down the line foul and out of play. 0 and 2. That's the thing he wants to do 
That's why many people think that the left hand hitter in this park is really uh, better off than the right hander because you don't really have to hit that ball that hard to the opposite field. And if you pull the ball with any kind of power, you can reach the seats down the line and you have a lot of room in right center field. But left field, you don't have to hit it that hard and hit that wall. Interesting. You know, the Red Sox have produced a batting champion 18 times and only two right hand batters. And Dale Alexander, the only two. 0 oh 2 to Billy Bucks. Curveball, and he just did get a piece as he throws his bat at it. That's the new term in baseball. That's the emergency swing. In case it's close, it's an emergency. Get a piece of it, and he does. He's fooled on it, and there goes the bat. Now that's really the Charlie Lau theory overdone, I believe, then. Yes, except he's only struck out 25 times all year. Mel Stottlemyre sweating out Bobby Ojeda's performance right now, the Mets pitching coach. 0 oh 2, the count to Bill Buckner. And Dykstra has moved over towards left center field. They expect him to hit from center field to the left field line. And got him on a pitch up. And that might even have been out of the strike zone. It was borderline, and Buckner angry at himself. There's a fellow who doesn't strike out and just did. That's the third strikeout for Ojeda. And the batter is Jim Rice. And here's why Davey Johnson goes out to talk to his pitcher. In this ballpark, you got a guy like Rice, two guys on. You know what that means. A four-run lead isn't very much here. And now it's a three-run lead with the Mets leading four to one. And Rice could get him even in a hurry. Fastball hit and short hop by Santana feeds Backman and they're out of the jam. Two hits and a walk, a run in and two left, and at the end of three, four to one, New York. That's the wall as Danny Heap steps in. Heap followed by Wilson and Santana. When Fenway Park was built in 1912. The first wall was made of wood, but they had a fire here in 34, so they had to rebuild it. And it was made out of tin with thousands of metal rivets to keep it in place. There's a ladder that goes alongside the scoreboard to the top of the wall, and if the ball hits the ladder, no one has any idea of where the ball will go. It went from wall to tin to fiberglass-like surface, which it has now. Besides the scoreboard and the ladder, when Freddie Lynn came here, they had to pad the wall to make sure he wouldn't be injured. Fly ball into center. Dave Henderson is there. One down. The wall is 37 feet high. As you look at the padding, there's two, two feet, I believe, of concrete below the pad. Then atop the 37-foot wall is the screen. And behind the wall is Lansdowne Street. And then you go on a little bit more and you get to the Massachusetts Turnpike and if you keep going Commonwealth Avenue. Here's Mookie Wilson. Mookie went down on strikes in the first inning. It's pretty apparent that the uh, oil can starting to head of those hitters now has found his curveball he's turning the ball over and he seems to have settled down. In between pitches because so much has been said about the wall. Left field here is almost a museum. Since 1939 there have only been three left fielders. Ted Williams, Carl Yastrzemski, and Jim Rice. And on the scoreboard, there they are. If you look at the scoreboard, there is a long white line under the P for pitcher and between the runs and pitchers when they give the scores. We'll show you that for good reason. Hopper to Barrett, and the play goes to Buck. Two down. It is, in a sense, ironic as we look at the scoreboard in left field. If you are an expert in Morse code, you'll see dash, dot, dash, dash, dot, dash, dash, etc. On the left side, spells out the initials T A Y. On the right side, J R Y for Thomas and Gene Yawkey. And isn't it interesting? that the Red Sox got into the World Series by beating an old Western Union telegrapher by the name of Gene Autry. 
Here's Santana hit into a force play in the first inning. disappeared out of sight or can the Sox catch up giving the four runs in the first inning. That's the story up to here. Knowing his background I guess you expect him to be high strung and damaged by it in the first inning. Two and two. Just change speeds that time. Santana way out in front. Little ground ball to third, trying to time it as Box. Santana runs pretty well, but Box shoots him down anyway. Eleven in a row, retired by Old Can Boyd at the end of three and a half, four to one, New York. Another little game within a game. Watch Gedman as he gives his sign. Now he wants the curveball. We talked about Oil Can having trouble seeing his signs. Now he gives it, but watch what he does. Curveball. He pretty well tells him just come right on over the top. No doubt about what that was going to be. Now in the bottom of the fourth inning, we'll see about any doubt for Bobby Ojeda. He surrendered a run on two hits and a walk in the third inning. And he'd be facing Baylor, who doubled, followed by Evans and Gedman. He looked at them in the second inning. Can't help but think, Vin. <laughs> in a World Series, the simplest way is still the best. Yeah, that's right. Just show him if you're having any trouble at all. Flutter ball at misses. Ball one. One and all. Oh, and he pops the change foul. Ray Knight coming over along with Gary Carter. Neither man will have a play. One of the things about pitching inside in this ballpark, if you miss, you want to miss towards the right handed batter because you want him, if he swings, to pull it foul. Because if you miss a little bit out over that plate, again, that wall will ask you to pay a pretty stiff price. And the guys that really show you that our guys like Rice and Baylor who's up there now he's right on top of that plate look at Carter just looking all over the place one and one well two two and one the temperature tonight at the start of the game in Boston 66 degrees Mets four Red Sox one bottom of the four ground ball to the hole Santana with the long throw Away. Santana's one of those shortstops. It's a career record. I mean by that, he gets it and he holds it. It makes you run the whole distance, and he just gets you by a step. There are other guys that'll throw you out two feet from the batter's box, but not Santana. Now watch, he'll hold it, and now he flicks it, figuring an accurate throw is better than a hard throw. And Baylor had to run the whole distance. Santana is the opposite of Sean Dunstan of the Cubs, who has an incredible arm. He just picks the ball up and throws you out by 50 feet if he can. Well, he's a career saver. Yeah. <laughs> Here's Dwight Evans. He takes ball one. Dewey grounded to short in the second inning. All for one. Mets four, Sox one, bottom of the four. Red Sox came from behind 39 times this year. The Mets, of course, have had their share of tough wins. We've got a long way to go here in the fourth. One and one. Off speed, but he missed. Ball two, two and one. Some of those off speed pitches he throws, they go up there with the velocity of a fallen leaf. I don't know how he can ever reach the plate when he does it. Does that with his curveball. Two and one. There's a fastball, and he got away with it. He challenged him low and in 
side, and Evans is about as good a low ball hitter as there is in the American League. Buzzy, he, he had just thrown that infield fly before that. There's the fastball, low inside, mm -hmm. right in the power zone, and Dewey knew it. He couldn't believe he'd get it. Two and two. And then he changed and turned it over, ball three. So a full count to Evans, one out on the fourth. Chopper out in front of the plate. Carter's on it in fair ground and throws him out. He made him chase a bad ball. It was out of the strike zone. It was high. So two down in the fourth inning and Rich Gedman coming up. Here's the pitch. Carter really checking. You, you wonder how you can protect yourself as we watch Gutter uh, make the play. Ball one to Rich Gedman. Usually you ask your first baseman if he's playing a normal position, can you see my signs? If he says yes, then you know you're opening up too much. And he's just looking at everybody, both Latchman at third and Riniak at first. Off speed, they're going to check at third. No swing, says Dale Ford. And the count two balls and no strikes. Edmund had 16 home runs this year. Interestingly enough, 14 of them on the road, including two grand slams. In there, it's a pretty good shot to right field if you don't go down the line. Down the line is only 302, but it falls away to 380. to you by Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? And by MCI, communications for the next 100 years. Captain Drew Marshall of Pompano Beach, Florida and the Goodyear Blimp Enterprise. You know how long it takes to fly the blimp from Shea Stadium in New York to Boston? It's an eight hour trip. And Lenny Dykstra, who went all the way around the bases much quicker than that to lead off the game, fouls it off. Dykstra homered and grounded out. For Oil Can Boyd, and perhaps you can blame it on his nervous system, it should not come as too much of a surprise that he gave up the four runs in the first inning. In game six of the American League Championship Series, he faced eight batters and gave up two runs in the first inning. Then only one run the next six innings. One and one. And that's lifted back a short, and it's going to land in front of Jim Rice for a bloop single to left. So Dykstra is aboard, and that breaks the string. He had retired 11 in a row. The last Mets hit was a single by Danny Heap. So a little flair, as the modern-day ball player calls it, no longer a Texas leaguer, a flair. And the batter is Wally Backman. Single to right and struck out, one for two. Backman and Dykstra are inseparable buddies during the year. They live very close to each other. Usually they alternate one week at a time driving to the ballpark. And if you ask Backman what's the difference, he says Dykstra wears stripes with plaid. He's a, a beach boy, is Dykstra. Ball one. And Gedman wants to talk to the can. Gedman, I'm sure, just wants him to keep his good stuff on the ball, but as always, when Dykstra's on and Backman's in that batter's box, you have to think about this little guy, Backman, bunting the ball and dragging it past Oil Cam Boyd, especially with uh, Buckner at first base. And Dykstra, who led the Mets with 31 stolen bases. Remember, the Sox stole 41 as a team. 1 0 to Wally Backman. They've got Oil Can and Getman thinking, and Barrett will have to be the key man at second base to protect Buckner at first base. So they break up the infield, Dykstra and Backman do. Box short on the grass. 
And there goes Dykstra. Hit and run foul ball. And Backman tried to fight it off. Hit it into left field and fouled it into the stand. He picked the right man because Owen was covering. And that was a good piece of hitting on the part of Backman. Because he saw Owen and he's just going to punch that ball even though it was inside. I tell you, these two guys, when they get on, they have... They cause more meetings like right now. There's Oil Cam Boyd and there's Barrett out there talking. Dykstra's still looking at uh, Harrelson to see if anything is on. There's a pretty good reason, I think, because Dykstra had a tremendous jump. The can really didn't even look over there. And I think Gedman and Barrett are going out saying, look, this guy runs. You've got to at least look at him. Watch his jump. See, Boyd never looked. He started early. He started early, too. Yeah. Oh, and stopped. If he'd have gone that first time, he might have stolen that base. One ball and one strike to count. Well, we'll keep an eye on Dykstra. Nobody out in the fifth inning. Four to one Mets. One and one. Two and one. If you're the base runner looking over at Oil Can Boy, remember we mentioned he has a high set. He brings his hands together up above the letters on his chest. And the one thing he did that time, it was a very pronounced set. He slapped his elbows into his side. Remember the way Joe Morgan used to hit? Well, that's the way he slapped those elbows in. He can do so many things because Backman is such a good bunner. And they're going to go over now. Of course, it figured he got away with it when Backman swung at that pitch. Dykstra is trying desperately to read the can's move. He's really bearing down, as you can see on that, and he had ideas. Pretty good lead, too. He's going two and one and swung on and hit to Buckner. He had another good jump. In fact, I was surprised Boyd didn't throw to first because he had such a good lead. So Backman pops out or grounds out to Buckner, moving Dykstra along, and the batter is Keith Hernandez. He had three steps as he was going towards the plate. Now you can see Dykstra, though, looking towards the plate uh, because the hit and run play was on. He wants to see what happens. It was not a straight steal. The other time he had such a big jump that I thought maybe that Backman might even take that pitch, yep. which he certainly can do. Well, now with one away, Hernandez trying to pick him up. Dykstra at second in the fifth inning, four to one Mets. On deck, Gary Carter. Hernandez single to center and grounded to Buckner. When he grounded in the second inning, it was a little surprising. We we're expecting Hernandez to hit like Boggs in the sense take the outside pitch and go the other way with it here. He tried to pull it and just hit a little ground ball. Jim Rice is pinching the middle as is Dwight Evans and right. So they're giving Hernandez the lines in left and right. Dykstra, good runner at second base. Ball two. Henderson in center field is straight away. Hernandez uses the whole ballpark. But with two balls and no strikes, he can have himself a pretty good cut. In there. Probably the hardest swing Hernandez took in the series was that out to Dwight Evans right down the right field line at Shea Stadium. He was going for the downs that time. But now they count two balls and one strike. speeds and Hernandez out in front. Ah, he knew it. One out, two balls, two strikes. Dykstra at second. And he drives it to right. Evans going back as Dykstra tags. Dwight for the catch and Dykstra will advance to third as Barrett runs the ball back to the infield and flip it to Spike on. So if nothing else, Hernandez got his man to third. Now it's up to Carter to pick him up with two out. And on deck, Darryl Strawberry. Carter doubled to drive in a run. Then Number fly eight. to center. Gary Carter, the catcher. Carter. Four runs, six 
hits for the Mets. One run, three hits for the Sox. We're in the fifth with two out. Lenny Dykstra on the bag at third. And he's out in front of an off speed pitch and fouls it into the crowd behind the dugout. Johnson and his crew all year long picked up an RBI his second of the World Series when he doubled in a run in the first inning. Now he has a chance to pick up his third. There it is again, curveball. Dykstra bluffing down the line. And the curve is popped up and going out to get it on the grass is Spike going, and that's that. The Mets lead Dykstra at third. And at the end of four and a half innings, the Mets score. Sox one. It's a curveball that gets Carter, and it was just a weak pop fly, but just watch his reaction. Ladies and gentlemen, the Red Sox remind you beer is not sold in Fenway Park after the seventh inning. Thank you. Wasn't that something? That'll cause you to do it. Yep. Slow curveball, and you pop it up, and we go to the bottom of the fifth. Four to one Mets with Henderson, Owen, and Boggs in that order. You know, when the series started, we talked about the fact that the Red Sox and the Mets, in a sense, shared one thing the common rivalry with the Yankees, and it has not been forgotten in Boston. There was a sign here at Fenway Park. It said, Sox two, Mets nothing. Yankees, no game today. Henderson single the left field in the third inning and do one for one. Well, one. He's a perfect example of what that wall will ask you if you make a mistake. He likes that ball up out away from him. You have to get it inside because if you get it up and away, look out. On the corner as he throws that off speed pitch. And the count one and one. Bobby Ojeda. Pitch him way down off speed. Don't let him get those big arms out there. Two and one. Oh, what a oh. great pitch. Wow. I think he had a string attached to that one, just yanked it back. Two and two to Dave Henderson. Take another look at it. You can see him as he grips it. Just off speed, he is way out in front. trying to defuse a bomb that's what Bobby Ojeda does he stands out there and throws change after change if he makes a mistake he gets killed instead he picks up his fourth strikeout the oversimplification of pitching is to keep the hitter off stride and there was the classic example the Reds a very good team in the National League very good hitting team he struck out 10 in a game against them where's Spike Owen who might be the kind of hitter who doesn't figure to strike out against an off speed pitcher because he is not a, a big hacker and he lined out the third in the third inning. Right. Spike followed by Wade Boggs. showed him that he does have a fastball a little rip job and the count one and one and you see where he put it he put it inside as if to send a message that I'm not afraid to come in there one ball one strike all two two and one straight away as you can get fastball hit to the right side smothered by Backman who throws him out that's strictly going to dirt and get it Davy Johnson really likes Backman I'll tell you he says the chemistry and the drive that the Backman has just goes right off the Richter scale 
put it together and you got yourself a pretty good second baseman and you just saw it there. You know when you said Davey Johnson liked him no one in the Mets organization was that fond of his abilities except Backman who played for Davey Johnson at Tidewater. So when Davey got the job with the Mets he knew about Backman's abilities and of course Backman became a star. Here's Wade Boggs. Fastball. Wow, started him right off. Surprised him for a strike. Boggs hasn't swung at the first pitch yet, so why not try it? And he's ahead of him, although it doesn't mean much with him. 2 2 is his favorite count, Wade Boggs. 0 oh and 1. And he lines it the other way. That's his strategy from the speaker to the left field line, and I tell you, he can really handle that bat. So Boggs singles to left. He's one for two, and that'll bring up Marty Barrett. Take another look at it. Inside out, he's going all the way. There you see it. Well, what a hit. A magician. He in that batting way or something. Now Marty Barrett hit back to the box in the first inning, and as he has done so often in the series, gone the other way and single to right. He's got a big hole between first and second with Box on it first. His single to right scored Henderson from second base for the only Sox run in the third inning. Strike. That's Ojeda's plan, trying all night to stay ahead of the hitters. No balls, one strike. On deck, Bill Buckley. And did you see how Gary Carter caught that ball? He caught it with the face of the glove on facing the ground. I mean, not coming up. There's the grip. Across the seams means a high riding fastball. That's a change of pace thing. If he stays with that grip, yeah. one and one. He did. Ball two, two and one. A pitcher like Ojeda, all you can think of, and Davey Johnson must think of it once in a while. A high wire act in a windstorm. Can he possibly make it to the other side? Ojeda with his changeup is just barely making the speed limit. He's 65 miles an hour. Two and one. Over it. Change in there. So Deuce is wild on Marty Barrett with Bob's at first. Four to one Mets. We're in the bottom of the fifth inning. The radar gun with the smile said 62 miles. I think Carter was 55 throwing it back. Two and two. Time. Time. He just about didn't make it. You could see the confusion. Wendell Stett's going to talk to him about it. He said, Why are you just taking too much time? And Barrett apologizing to it. Yeah, the rules say that the umpire does not have to call time at all when a pitcher is in his delivery. And you see, Ojeda was in his delivery. However, an umpire is always worried that if the hitter begs for time and winds up getting hit in the head it would be a disaster so he, he let Barrett get away with it but he doesn't have to not that late. Ball three. Now of course with a full count Carter pointing reminding him Buckner's on deck and the fact that Boggs will be going at first Hernandez back and off the bag. Pitch Buckner on deck would be the possible tying run. Runner goes, shot up the middle, base hit. Boggs will hold as Dykstra throws back of him to Backman. So the Red Sox are in business with two out. Boggs and Barrett single, and here comes Buckner. Barrett is one of those guys as we look at Stottlemyre. Barrett just keeps the inning alive. Nothing flashy, just dependable, and how valuable a player like that can be because now you got your third, fourth, and fifth place hitters up there, and that's how you score the runs. And as you can see, Buckner was equal to the challenge behind Jim Rice. And the Sox can manufacture runs in a hurry, and he had the opportunity. Boggs at second, Barrett at first, two out. Buckner flied to right pretty deep and struck out. Ojeda 
facing his third challenge of the night. Remember the Baylor double in the second inning, the two singles and a walk for a run in the third, and now back to back singles here in the fifth. Starts him with a breaking ball for a strike. And of course, as you look at this inning, remember the ball that Spike Owen hit. Wally Backman making that diving, smothering stop, or else Ojeda would have given up three consecutive hits. Fastball, and he was late on it. Santana to Backman for the fours. Buckner never got around on it, and the hitters are being lulled by the changeup, and the fastball is leaving them at the platform. 4 1 New York. I want to be a part of everything, and I want Davey Johnson to turn to me uh, in those crucial times as he's done all year. And, and uh, I feel like I'm the guy to come through with a big hit when they need it. And, and, you know, I have confidence in my ability to do that. So when you come down to making out a lineup, uh, I like to think that he thinks of my name. And, and uh, obviously the matchup was good uh, for Hojo and, and, and Danny Heap because they are uh, good fastball hitters. But nonetheless, it hurt my feelings simply because uh, I, I feel that I'm a fastball hitter too, and, and we've won with me all year. And I was just disappointed that I wasn't a part of it. Here's Daryl Strawberry. Talk about disappointed. And he lifts a fly ball into left center, and Dave Henderson is there. One away. You know, Ray Knight talking about not being in the lineup as he comes up to the plate. But let's go back a little bit. Remember, it was the fourth inning. The Red Sox were leading four to two. Danny Heap walked. And Johnson hit a ball that I would say 90% of the time is a home run into the Mets bullpen, and it would have tied up the game. Then all of a sudden, Johnson's move would have been remarkable. Shot foul, and that'll skin them scurrying in the far end of the dugout, not to mention what it'll do to a cameraman. But he's big enough to take it. <laughs> the dangerous territory when they get that ball inside or they're going to try to pull that ball against the wall. That was an off speed pitch, and Ray Knight just went out and got it, and he just jerked it right to the left side. Choice and popped up, but the fielder's choice is a big part of the ball game. Little roller down to shortstop, backhanded by Owen, almost threw it away. Good play by Billy Buck. That was the perfect pitch, Ben, that uh, the hitter really should stay away from if he's going to try to pull it against the wall, low outside. You cannot pull that pitch. Now he's got plenty of time here, and he just throws it badly. But it was a routine ground ball. 25. Buckner makes a nice play, dancing over in the foul territory. So with two out here in the sixth inning, Danny Heap will be coming up. Take another look at Owen's throw. It just was a sailor. Buckner able to handle it and at the same time get out of the way of Knight. Remember when Knight hit the ground ball to Boggs and the Sox should have gotten at least one and instead messed up the rundown and the bases were loaded. And then Heap single to drive in two runs. That's the biggest single play of the night. Last time up, he flied to center in the fourth. Ball two, two and no. Oh. Dennis Oil Can Boy. Boy, what a story he's been here in Boston. Off the end of the bat, little fly ball to right, and Evans comes up for it. So the Mets tiptoe quietly in the sixth inning. Six in a row retired by the can, and at the end of five and a half, four one Mets. An interesting contrast in styles has developed as we go to the bottom of the sixth inning. Oil can Boyd, you remember, had a bad first inning. He has retired 17 of the last 18 batters that he has faced since his trouble. Meanwhile, Ojeda had a one, two, three first inning and has been in some treble every inning but the fourth. So the can has settled down. Now it's a question of whether the Sox can catch Ojeda. Jim Rice, Don Baylor, and Dwight Evans in that order. Rice struck out, called out on a 3-2 pitch, and that was followed by Baylor's double. That was a big call. Well, one last time up, he hit into a force play at short. That was in the third inning. He led the Sox in home runs here at Fenway. He hit 10 here this year. Ball two. Fouled away. A little late on the fastball. He didn't have. 
have a good hack at it and it goes up on the roof. Well, his hitting theory is pretty simple. I see the ball, I react. If you've got good reflexes, you don't need philosophy. And with 10 home runs at Fenway, he's proven his point. Two and one. Messages and the good pitcher does that. He backs him right off the plate. That sets up his off speed pitches. Three and one. And he missed. So another Red Sox runner gets aboard. And Rice opens up the sixth inning with a walk. Johnson knows he barely got out of the fifth inning without giving up a run. As we said, a play by Backman followed by two singles. Now Rice walks and here's Baylor who doubled and grounded to short. Four one Mets. But it's a bumpy ride for Bobby Ojeda here in the sixth. have much of a target inside because Baylor hovers over that plate and strong enough to pull that pitch outside against that left field wall. Look how close he is to that plate. He's daring you. Fastball for a strike. Well that's threatening the needle right there. I mean low outside. Perfect pitch. Baylor on top of the plate number one because he doesn't like the ball inside. That's why he gets hit so much. He wants you to get it away from him. And that's fisted in the air. A little blooper to Santana, and Knight takes it away from him. A little lack of communication there. Ojeda came inside with his fastball, not known as a fastball pitcher, and he was able to jam uh, Baylor. And looks like Santana's going to make the play, and Knight says, Oh, I'll take it as long as I'm here. So one away. Bryce still at first, and Dwight Evans will be coming up. Ballet and a bump. Evans grounded to short, and remember last time up in the fourth inning, chopped the ball out in front of the plate, killed a few worms, and then Carter threw him out. Standing at first, Jim Rice. Started him with a change and got it over this time. Oh, and one. has a ritual he look at Evans to see if he's in the same spot and then he'll look up to see if he's sneaking a look and then down the first baseline there he is looking up and there he is down the first baseline and Evans asking for time again just as Ojeda was ready to deliver they're really giving him a bad time that way Marty Barrett did it and then single one and one It's okay to ask for time now, but that's twice the Red Sox have gotten away with bending the rule. One ball, one strike. Fastball, and it's hit foul off to the right. Very doubtful. It will be well back into the stand. One and two. Here's what we mean about Gary Carter behind that play, just checking everywhere. There you see him looking down the first baseline. Checking Evans. Back to first. One and two the count. One out. Hit in the air, foul, slicing down the right field line, and that figures to go well back into the stand. You know, if you're a hitter, you have to love Fenway. Never mind the wall, never mind the dimensions down the line. Outside of a round home plate, there's hardly any foul ground at all here. So of course you can foul balls that in a lot of other ballparks will be caught and here you get a bunch of extra swings over the course of a game or a year. Could have been changing speeds on Evans had him off stride almost on every pitch. This would be an interesting one coming up here. He's got him set up for whatever he wants to do. One and two. And he gave him the change up and Dewey is way out in front of it. Boy, that is something. That's five strikeouts for Bobby Ojeda. 
He really he, he changed speeds on him, and with two strikes, he could have gone anyway. Fastball up and in, or do what he did right here. And Dewey trying to protect that play, and he got it in a great spot. Interesting watching Ojeda. It's not as if he, he fakes you with his head or his shoulder. It must be must have something to do with the arm speed and the stride where you have to think it's coming harder than it is. He starts getting with a breaking ball. And there's no question about that. And he also the, the rhythm with which he pitches that's what's causing Barrett to back out and Evans to back out. He's not getting the ball pitch get the ball pitch get the ball pitch. He's, he's varying it. One and oh. On the hands with a fastball it's hit high and foul. Coming over is Carter and Hernandez no play. Carter's coming over. He thinks he has a play and the wind's swirling here. He finds himself. You saw him look for the stands. He knows how much room he has. Still looking. And then Hernandez comes over. And he kind of gave it one of those attempts, hoping it was there. I was wondering about a catcher, and I realize that you call it, so you shouldn't be fooled on a chain. But the hitter is way out in front. Do you ever find yourself when you were catching a guy through changes, you were lunging at the ball sometimes? Only if he did it on his own. And then you go out and talk to him because that messes up the infielders. You know, you should never be fooled. One ball and one strike to Rich Gedman. Curveball. Oh, did he break off a deuce. Years ago, Roy Campanella called that public enemy number one, and that has imprisoned more hitters than anything you'd ever want to look at. Look at this snake. And he also took something off. I mean, that's not as good a curveball as oil cans for his breaking down, but the off speed, the way he changes speeds, and again, he's got him set up perfectly. Another curve, and they're going to check it third. No swing, and an emphatic call by Dale Ford. I mean, he was going to let everybody in the state know. I think he was a little bit annoyed that Carter would even ask. I don't know. I would ask. I would ask. I mean, it was almost like he wanted some TV time. Two and two. In the dirt, the curveball goes behind Carter, and moving to second base is Rice. Carter instinctively waving with his hand as he went back after the ball, telling Knight to go to third and waking up Ojeda as well. Watch him. The curveball just got right on by him. Looks like he started to shift. He didn't get his body in front of it, but he did have the glove there, and it was just a 55 footer. Now, here's a big pitch, three and two on deck. Dave Henderson. Four to one Mets at the end of six. We'll be right back after these messages from your local station. Okay, Wilson. Field, Wilson. Here is Gedman taking the pitch and give Ojeda credit. Curveball, and of course, Gedman, that ball was outside and down. And then he winds up saying fertilizer. And Mookie Wilson, it's a high foul ball down the right field line. Buckner with Barrett behind him. It's Buckner. One out in the seventh inning, and Rafael Santana coming up. Oil Can Boyd has now retired 18 of his last 19 batters, but he was touched up and roughed up for a four run first inning, and it's four to one New York in the seventh. Santana hit into a force play, grounded to third, 0 for 2. Sunday against Roger Clemens. He came into the postseason really sharpened up. He had a, a very quiet bat all year and he hit about 280 the last month or so. On one. Flying open. Oh and two. Oil can boy. One of the 
great quotes of the year was in May when the Red Sox had a game fogged out in Cleveland. He said, what do you expect when you build a stadium by the ocean? <laughs> so he wasn't a geography major at Jackson State. Up the middle for a base hit on an 0-2 pitch. So a one-out single to center by Santana. And it'll bring up Len Dykstra. Friends, we'd like to remind you once again, we'll be selecting the NBC Miller Lite Player of the Game at the conclusion of the ball game. At seven hits off the can, Lenny Dykstra homered in the first inning to right, grounded out in the second, and singled to left in the fifth, and they left him at third. So Dykstra two for three, with Wally Backman on deck. Looking bunt, Boggs has to look bunt. He's in on the grass at third. I'd look for a play more than I would a bunt. Mm -hmm. Maybe hit and run right yes, now. Yes, sir. One ball and no strikes. In fact, I think I'd pitch out. One and one. Every now and then, Davy Johnson goes wild because he thinks Dykstra is taking a home run swing. Of course, the home run was a big one in the league championship series, and he hit a home run in the first inning. But I'm sure Bill Robinson and Davey constantly saying to Dykstra, hey, little man, you're not up there to hit a home run. He took a home run swing on that pitch. One and one. And there's the bunt we thought about. Strike two. Davey might have put that on after he took that big swing. Mm -hmm. Maybe. He said, hold it. John McNamara enjoying the fruits of his labors so far this year. One and two to Lenny Dykstra. Now with two strikes, Boggs is sure Dykstra wouldn't try to bunt. He goes back to a normal depth. Buckner holding the corner on Santana. it into right field base hit Santana to second Evans with the good arm and Santana will not test him. I love when outfielders do that too they see that runner go back so they throw it to shortstop and the runner just happens to be in the vicinity he's got to go down it's almost like an outfielder knockdown pitch throw it right at his head. So first and second watch this now watch him take dead aim at Santana. The Santana just standing there. You better get down. <laughs> That's just a little message, friendly message. Well, now Wally Backman comes up with two on and one out in the seventh, four to one New York. Joe Sambito and Bob Stanley begin to loosen up in the Red Sox bullpen. Backman single struck out and grounded out. Right. Backman's hitting theory is very simple. He tries to take the fastball over the shortstop's head. As we look at Stanley and Sambito, Sambito the left hander. And he is taking the fastball in the shortstop head. If he is a little bit early, it's right up the middle where there's the most room. Boyd has not walked a batter tonight. He's in a little trouble here, however. Two on, one out. Good. And Backman way out in front of that one. Remember now, the hit was 0 and 2 to Santana. So maybe his control was a little too good in those sequences of pitches. Then Dykstra singled. Now he has Backman 0 and 2. On deck, Keith Hernandez. Little fly ball to shallow left. Rice has a play. So the runners hold. In talking about Boyd, control, of course, is one of the mainstays of his work. He walked more than two in a game only three times this year. But he's throwing strikes. Still no walks tonight, and now he goes head to head with a man who walks a lot, Keith Hernandez. Hernandez single to center, grounded to Buckner, and flied to right.
two on two out seventh inning four one New York looking ahead for the Sox they'll have Henderson Owen and Boggs in the bottom of the seventh. and no strikes to count to Keith Hernandez Rafael Santana at second Lenny Dykstra at first two out in the seventh four one New York this is when you get in trouble a hitter like Hernandez has got that great concentration two balls and no strikes he'll look for a particular pitch in a particular spot two and oh remember where we showed you Buddy Harrelson was coaching from earlier where he was the coaching box. Now he's in front of the box because if Hernandez hits the ball down the right field line, then Harrelson will come way down the line to shepherd the runners. If there's a ball hit to left field, then he really has to make a decision with Santana. The fact that Rice can charge and come up throwing. 2 and 0, the count to Keith Hernandez. Shortstop is right behind Santana prior to the pitch. Carter on deck. Three and all in Shea Stadium. They gave Hernandez the green light. You can bet that if he got it there, he's got it here. So it's up to him if he wants to whack at this one. With 94 walks, you don't figure he'd chase a bad one. And he won't. And walks to load him up. So Gary Carter will come up with the bases loaded. Two out in the seventh inning with the Mets leading four to one and for the umpteenth time in postseason Carter has an opportunity to drive Carter, in some people. Carter. Carter. The last time he was up there and McNamara is coming out to talk to uh, oil can now the first walk in the game given up by the can. They were throwing curveballs to Carter but uh, see what happens here. Well, we see that walk is a distress signal. Whether John just trying to soothe his feathers. Can looks like he's pleading his case to a very tough judge. He's got his mind made up. He just wants to hear how El Can is answering his questions. Okay. If John wanted to take him out, he'd have hooked him right there. Go out there with your mind made up, and then you ask a few questions, and if they're tentative, boom out. Here we go. Carter with the bases loaded. Santana at third. Dykstra at second. Hernandez at first. Gary's home run, a slam in 86, was against David Palmer of Atlanta. Right. Looks like he started him with a slider. Took something off. Time was two curveballs, and Gary hit the second one. He just changed speeds. 33,595 here at Fenway. Way out in front. And they want to explode with relief. So does McNamara. Location on this one would be most important. Crowd really alive now, trying to root the oil can out of it. Can's got his mind made up. He just wants to make sure that Gedman finally gets around to it. Two. Line drive, 
base hit into left field. Santana will score. Right back of him is Dykstra. The throw, he's in there, gets away from Gedman, and there are two Mets near second base. The throw to second, back to Buckner, and a one-legged first baseman chasing Carter, and the tag will be made at last at second base. So the Mets run themselves out of an inning, but not before they deposit two more. And at the end of six and a half innings, the Mets six, the Red Sox one. Here is Rice making the throw. And now it begins. It goes to the plate, runs, scores, and they've got two base runners down at second base. And Carter's in no man's land. That's some race, isn't it? <laughs> Carter, yeah, Carter's trying to stay in it long enough to let Hernandez try to come around and score, but no way he could do that. If you're keeping score, remember the throw started as Oil Can walks off downcast and disgusted. That last play went 7 2, 4 3 6. Well, he really has no one to blame but himself. The best pitch that Carter had to hit was the two-strike pitch. He had a two-strike count and, and gave a base hit away, and then the big clutch hit to uh, Carter. Dave Henderson, spike on, and that's as quiet a seventh-inning stretch as you will ever see outside of Shea Stadium when we were there. The 33,000 stood up tentatively and then just sat back down. It is six to one New York in the seventh. Henderson singled and struck out down in the bullpen. Left hander Joe Sambito tuning up for the Sox, a former Met. So it could be they're going to put the lid on the can. Well, I don't know what gets the manager upset quicker than a two strike, no ball pitch that somebody can handle, which Santana and Carter did in that inning. One ball and one strike. Carter up there, and that base is loaded. You, you got him. Well, you could work on him and to give him a ball he could handle is just you, you can't pardon him. Big slow rainbow. Ball two. Two and one to Hindu. One for two. Six runs, nine hits for New York. One run, five hits for Boston. to do is walk a leadoff man. That's the third walk that Ojeda has given up. Three walks, six strikeouts. And here is Spike Owen, line to third. And remember, Backman made a big play on him. And Johnson saw Backman throw out Owen and then Boggs and Barrett single consecutively. Especially in this ballpark, the one thing you want to stay away from is the base on balls. You got to make them hit their way on, and that's pretty much what Carter will do. He maybe buy a little time for the bullpen. No one throwing yet, and I use that word yet advisedly because windbreakers are coming off in the Mets bullpen. The Sox, as we know, Joe Sambito is getting ready, but they're moving around now in the New York bullpen. And 
nice darn little wave. Seven strikes, 46 balls, 103 pitches, so I couldn't say that would get you an award. Three and one. In there. On deck, Wade Barnes, who has a walk and a single in three trips. Well, he has been able to make that big pitch when he's had to do it. And this is a big one for him right now. Three and two to Spike Owen. Six one New York bottom of the seven nobody out. Ojeda has retired the side in order only twice in the first inning and in the fourth inning. hit away from Spike on ball is well hit Backman comes up with it finds his man even though he's off balance and Santana didn't wait that time he knew who was running and he makes a tremendous pivot here's the play right here to be off balance and give Santana such a good ball to handle so Spike Owen should be two for two in his last two at bats he has been robbed twice and each time would put a roadblock up against the Red Sox offense in the fifth inning Backman robbed him and then you had singles by Boggs and Barrett and now he takes the steam out in the seventh on a shot to right and Backman turns it into a deuce. Two and oh it is almost a note of irony to see Wally Backman making dazzling plays and realize the only difference between these two teams in game one. Tim Tuffle. Pop foul off third. Knight not quitting. He comes to the lip of the dugout, but it's back in. Two and one. Boy, that's got to bust you inside when you hit a ball that hard, and instead of a base hit, you hit into a double play. That's the difference between the major leagues and the minor leagues. And then the major league hitter box coming up instead of having people out there and the place going crazy. You have two out, base is empty. What a play. That's what you tell the pitcher. Give us a chance as we look at Tuffle. Give us a chance to make a play. We'll make it. But a base on balls. There's no defense against that. Doing one. Popped in the air around the plate, and Carter says he has it. He Tough play. His mask away very early, and he winds up four feet in front of it. Wally Backman turned that inning completely inside out, just as he did the fifth inning, and it's six-one New York. Thirty four year old Joe Sambito born in Brooklyn New York but raised in the Houston organization and he was a solid performer for the Astros particularly back around 1979 1980 and 1981 then he had arm trouble didn't play at all in 83 eventually came out of the Houston organization and the Mets picked him up then from the Mets this year. He wound up winning two no losses for Boston before joining the Red Sox this year he hadn't had a save since April of 82. So Joe Sambito against the Mets and it'll be Darryl Strawberry Ray Knight and Danny Heap. Strawberry has struck out and twice fly to center. Six to one New York battling to stay alive in the World Series we're in the eighth inning. Sambito is greeted with a line drive base hit to center. So Daryl Strawberry leads off with the base hit. That'll bring up Ray Knight. 
22. Well, Ken Boyd went seven innings, allowed six runs, nine hits, five of the hits, and four of the runs in the first inning. The can walked one and struck out four. Ray Knight aboard on the field is choice. Bad defensive play by the Sox, allowing the Mets to load the bases and then heap single to drive in two in the first inning. Knight since then popped up, grounded out. Kevin Mitchell is now out on deck, right hand or left, and he'll be hitting evidently for Danny Heap. So Mitchell, a switch hitter on deck. There's Kevin. Strawberry at first, nobody out in the eighth. Six one minutes. Against left hand batters held them to less than a 200 batting average this year. So it was a little surprised to see Strawberry walk up there and bang one to center on him. And he's in the dirt. Strawberry is on his way to second. Sambito recovers, but no chance to throw. Strawberry really didn't hesitate at all. As soon as that ball hit the dirt, he took off. He was very alert. Hit the Gedman shin guards and rolled right out to the plate. Right off the left shin guard, and Sambito comes up with it, but way too late. Wild pitch, allowing Strawberry to take second, and the count two balls and no strikes to Ray Knight. Tomorrow night, game four figures to be Al Nipper for Boston and Ron Darling for the Mets. The mitt and that thing really sailed. He crossed him up, man. I gotta believe that. Oh, yeah. You know, basically, Sambito is a sinker ball pitcher. Uh, he, he had to cross him up on that one. He was just talking there. They're calling that a pass ball on Gedman, but he had no idea. I think he was looking for a ball down, and look at how high it is, He's, although he did get his mitt on it. Yeah, but it, it almost like he, was, he just was looking for a breaking ball, not only down, down but a breaking ball. Now the infield's got to come in. And Bob Stanley is up in the Sox bullpen. So Strawberry at third, nobody out in the eighth, 6 1 Mets, and Knight trying to pick him up. Foul back. So they let him rip 3 0, oh, and he fouled it away. You have Lee Mazzilli also coming out on deck, along with Kevin Mitchell. John McNamara has seen the Mets jump on Boyd for four in the first inning and then break it open somewhat in the seventh. Ground ball inside third and down the line into the corner. So Strawberry scores easily. Knight into second base and holding. So the Mets number one hitter against left hand pitching doubles into the corner and gives the Mets a very comfortable seven to one lead and all of a sudden Fenway Park sounds like Shea Stadium. Wide of the bag and it's just between Boggs and the bag and Strawberry easily sees, he can just walk in. John McNamara talking about walking is on his way to the mound. He's had Bob Stanley warming up out there, and it's the whole raft of pinch hitters coming out. And he wants him. So Bob Stanley will be coming in, and the Mets, who did not have an extra base hit, are feasting on him tonight. Just a reminder for all you folks about local news on most of these NBC stations coming up next. Relief pitcher Bob Stanley will have to pick up the pieces from Joe Sambito. Stanley, who pitched so well Sunday night, he worked three innings, allowed just two hits, struck out three, and they could have written his name in capital letters that night. Right now, with a 7-1 score, John just writes it out, normal style. 
the big Stanley who has that great palm ball to left hand batters so we might look for it right now Lee Mazzilli is the hitter and in case you wonder he's hitting for Kevin Mitchell remember Mitchell and Mazzilli were out on deck to bat for Danny Heath and Mitchell was technically in the game. Stanley also has a good sinker to go with that palm ball and if he's got the good sinker going uh, he could get the ground ball and that of course is what they're looking for. Interesting thing about Lee Mazzilli when he originally signed as a free agent with Tidewater in the Mets farm system. Here's a ground ball to Marty Barrett that will move Knight over just to conclude the thought Mazzilli in his first game hit a home run against the triple A team that belonged to the Boston Red Sox for Tucker. No big deal but it happened. So Knight at third one away and here's Mookie Wilson struck out grounded out fouled out. Fouled away so far anyway. The only writers capable of handling this story for the state of Massachusetts would be John Updike, Stephen King, or Robert Parker. It is seven to one New York. The infield up. A strike to Mookie. Oh and two. Seven runs, eleven hits for the Mets, one run, five hits for the Red Sox. This is where Stanley would be looking for that palm ball he threw Hernandez to get that big strikeout. 0 oh and 2. Fouled away. In the inning, Strawberry single to center against Sambito. He was wild pitched to second, and a fastball got him to third. Knight doubled him in, and Mazzilli grounds out. Knight taking third. Tim Waller begins to air it out in the Red Sox bullpen. Foul ball out of play, and there was the palm ball. You could see Mookie kind of, you talk about a double clutch when you're defensive. He was double clutching with a hitting, trying to hold back on it. I'm not kidding you. When you get that off speed pitch and you're really looking for something else and it's a real good one, you can almost feel your feet leaving you. One and two, the count of Mookie Wilson. Then Al Nipper uh, has gone home for the night. He's going to mm -hmm. pitch tomorrow. He wants his rest, and so he watched most of the game, and he'll be ready for tomorrow. We just got that word. On the hands, and Mookie fought it off. Boy, that was a good pitch. Did a good job just to stay alive. One and two. There's that palm ball once again. I was talking to Stanley about it. I said, not only the palm ball, look at the expression on his face, but you can see. There's the rotation. That's what the batter is seeing. One and two. The count to Mookie Wilson. Fouled away again. For some reason, when, even in my day when they threw that thing, you know the feeling you get? You ever see a, something in a dryer by itself that it just tumbles, tumbles? Mm -hmm. That's the feeling you yeah. get. start for Al Nipper tomorrow night. I was just thinking about it. A year ago, he went on the disabled list with an ulcer. So it might be a tough night's sleep for him tonight. Way out in front. The palm ball gets another left-hand hitter. Big strikeout in that spot. Now the infield course can drop back with two men out. He did what he had to do, get the ground ball. He lost the base, but he gets the strikeout. That's the fourth World Series strikeout for Bob Stanley. You could really see the rotation on that ball. And Mookie out in front had a good cut, but a little bit too far out in front. Rafael Santana hit into a force play, grounded to third, single to center. Came around to score in the seventh inning. Santana one for three. Middleman on that big double play in the seventh inning started by Wally Backman. Santana also when you think about it in the third inning made a tough play look so easy on it there's a comeback of the Stanley. So Santana is not going to get any headlines but he's had a pretty good evening. So have the Mets as a team. They pick up another run and they lead seven to one. 
Well, we talk about tradition continuing the past and the present here tonight. You're looking at former commissioner of baseball, Bowie Kuhn, and the present commissioner of baseball, Peter Uberon. Roger McDowell will now try and pick up the loose ends and tie it up for Bobby Ojeda in the eighth inning. Seven to one, New York. There has not been an opposing left hander to go the distance at Fenway Park since Frank Viola in August of 85. But Ojeda did the next best thing. He gave the Mets a strong seven innings, thanks particularly to two big plays by Wally Backman. Remember, Bobby Ojeda got the Mets' first win against Houston with a complete game five to one victory. He certainly made his contribution. But now it'll be Barrett, Buckner, and Rice against Roger McDowell. Sinker and Marty Barrett has hit back to the box and then singled twice against Ojeda. One and one. Ron Darling, he'll go tomorrow night against Al Nipper. So while Al Nipper is home getting his rest, Darling is here charting pitches. That McDowell sinker, they just refer to it as nasty. In fact, I remember a year ago, he had such a good sinker, immediately somebody thought maybe he was monkeying around, but no official protest made. There's a sinker, and it's hit wide at first. Hernandez does a 360 and hits his man on the move. Boy, that's a pretty play to watch. Hmm. When you watch that play, the thing that Hernandez does, in addition to the 360, is he doesn't panic. Now he comes up, he finds his man right there. He made sure he knew exactly where he was. And look at the textbook. McDowell hitting the inside part of the bag with his right foot to get away from the runner. Make the left turn. Stay the inside of the diamond. Practice One away. that all spring training. Buckner flied to right, struck out, hit into a force play, and that's a strike. 0-1. Seven one New York bottom of the eighth game four tomorrow night Al Nipper and Ron Darling. One and one. The Mets scored four in the first two in the seventh one in the eighth the only Red Sox run in the third inning kind of a whimper of protest so far. Number. Down to get it is McDowell. No contest if he can get it out of his glove, and he barely did. But did you see the play Hernandez made? Again, Hernandez dances over into foul territory. Now watch what happens here. The momentum of McDowell, it carries him over into foul territory. And if Hernandez stays in fair territory, the runner gets between him. Look where he is in foul territory, giving him a perfect line of vision. And remember, you got a guy on one leg trying to hustle down the line. Fine play. Two oh, down. I tell you, he's a he is really something at first base. You take that kind of a play for granted. If he stays there, it could have possibly hit Buckner, but he wouldn't take the chance. Dances over there and it's an easy play. Here's Rice. Struck out, hit into a force play and walk. Golf's one to third. Knight can set for the hop. And that's that. So the Sox go very quietly in the eighth inning and at the end of eight. New York seven and Boston one. Red Sox trying to make it three to one and of course the Mets if they hold on to any part of the lead tonight will try and tie up the series. Lenny Dykstra who started the Mets off in the right direction homered leading off the game and promptly grounds one of the hole backhanded by Owen to throw to first he beats the throw and that will be the fourth hit for Len Dykstra three singles and a home run. So the kid from Garden Grove that they call Nails has stuck a few nails in the socks tonight. Owen makes a nice play, but no chance to get Dykstra. He tries. Wally Backman, second base. 
So a runner aboard, nobody out. And the batter will be Wally Backman, singled in the first inning, struck out twice and grounded out since, scored a run, and made two very vital plays defensively. This could have been a different game. If he doesn't make the play in the fifth inning, you have a runner at first and one out, and then Boggs and Barrett each single. They would have scored in the fifth with the Red Sox. And in the seventh inning, a walk to Henderson, and it looked like maybe the Sox would make a run. And Spike Owen had a base hit turned into a double play by Backman. Two very big plays. A couple of left handers throwing in the pens. The hardly used Tim Lawler in the Boston pen. And Jesse Orozco is kind of stretching out in New York. And Doug Sisk is going to join Orozco. Bouncer over the mound down to short. Owen is going to feed Barrett and they get a force. That's all. I thought maybe Spike would try to step on the bag. And by the time he was able to get the ball to Barrett, Barrett just had to get out of there for his life. Of course, with those two little rabbits, you doubt very seriously if they would have been able to come up with two, but he's close enough to maybe take it himself. But yeah. I think he Perfect. said, well, I think I'm only going to get one any way I go. And Dykstra just made sure that Barrett didn't throw the ball. So Backman at first with one out and Keith Hernandez the batter singled and grounded out fly to right and walk Keith one for three scored a run in the first inning. of what you might think. A day of rest and the Mets produced seven runs and a dozen hits. And you've got to believe that Davey Johnson that it has to be the way it turns out now. A gutsy move because he was open to a lot of criticism but he thought that the day off would help his club to stay away from the criticism and by golly you look at that scoreboard he was right. To quote Joaquin Andujar which takes a great deal as Joaquin Andujar said about baseball I can tell you about it in one word you never know. Got that right. <laughs> yeah, that's why we were talking earlier about Oil Can Boyd pitching this game. There's a high foul out of play. Oil Can Boyd pitching the third game with his team leading two games to none. One year ago, it was the same situation. Joaquin Andujar. Lost to Bert Saberhagen six to one. And Kansas City was on a roll. All three. Three and two with one out. Buckner almost reluctantly goes over to the bag. Backman taking his lead. Let's see if they play run and hit. Nope. Instead, a base hit by a diving ball. And the Mets have runners at first and second, and Hernandez is two for four plus a walk. Just to clarify that for further reverence, in case you not follow baseball that closely, run and hit on a three ball count, the batter is certainly not obligated to swing at ball four. Hit and run, you swing to protect the runner. And here's Gary Carter. Carter doubled in a run in the first inning, fly to center, popped to short, and then singled with the bases loaded to drive in two in the seventh inning. You look at that scoreboard, Vin, and you think about the Red Sox the other night, 18 base hits. The Mets have now put up 13 base hits, so the termites are out of the bat rack. And how? The Mets who did not have an extra base hit in the first two games had Dykstra homer leading off Carter double later on they had a double by Ray Knight. One and one. And he hits a hopper down to Owens 
Spike goes to Marty and he goes to Billy Bucks and that's it. Six four three double play a couple of base hits and nothing else. And at the end of eight and a half seven one New York. Bobby Ojeda was the first pitcher in baseball history in the World Series to start a series game against the club for which he played the previous year. And he gave his team a strong seven innings, allowing just one run and five hits. Consequently, he stands to be the winning pitcher. And there's the note. Not since Hippo Vaughn in 1918. That was the year that Ted Williams was born. And the Red Sox won their last World Series. Well, he was certainly a big part in the events tonight. McDowell now is trying to get the last three outs. It'll be Don Baylor, Dwight Evans, and Rich Gedman. Mm-hmm. And Marty Barrett can just think about tomorrow, perhaps. Tomorrow night. Ron Darling and Al Nipper. Don Baylor against McDowell as John McNamara talks to his troops. Not really much to say in the bottom of the ninth, down 7 1. Baylor doubled, grounded a short, and popped up. Even a story on the double. Remember, Rice led off the inning. The count went three and two. He was called out on strikes. He thought it was ball four. Baylor doubled, but it was a non productive inning. Don, one for three. Well, he wants Harry Wendelstead to look at that sinker, and it's okay. Meanwhile, have to feel a rebirth. And Howard Johnson talking to the boy from Millbury, Ron Darling. Jim Rice will look back to that call strike three in the second inning as part of a long evening. And then hit the ball hard in the third, and Santana short hopped it and turned it into a routine force play, but it was a much tougher play than that. Head down. Bill Buckner is given his best shot. Buckner tonight 0 for 4. Sinker. Oh, he's got a vicious sinker. It, it just and it's a heavy ball. It's, it's almost impossible to get under that ball and, and lift it for the extra base hit, uh, the home run. You throw it low. It, it looks like it's a strike, and then all of a sudden she sinks. It's out of the zone, and it results in a ground ball. One and two. Another thing about a sinker ball pitcher. Remember, he relieved Darling. In the one to nothing loss. He didn't pitch in the Gooden game. You can see what the sinker has done. But the point is that it seems traditionally the more you use a sinker ball pitcher, as he gets tired, he becomes even more effective. He begins to drag his arm, and the sinker sinks even more. And it's hard to explain, but when you catch a sinker ball pitcher, your hand will puff up. I mean, it is a heavy ball. That's the way you describe it. It seems to land in your glove and just bore right in. It'll take two, three bites out of your hand, it seems like. And yet you'll have somebody who on the sidelines or, or throw that fastball and hit your mitt like he's stacking lumber, and you feel nothing. But the sinker baller, heavy. One and two. And that's a shot foul into the crowd. You see that a lot here, Ben, and it's inside, and uh, but it's so far inside you can't do anything but hit it foul. I wonder, and as we see John McNamara and Dick Bresciani and the Boston dugout, in watching Carter, as so many catchers do today, because they have that split catcher's mitt, you keep your left index finger out of the mitt. 
if that doesn't take some of the heat off the pitch as far as handling it. it takes a lot of it off and then they're catching it in the webbing. In the old days you really caught it in the pocket but with the split mitt you catch it uh, between the thumb and the index finger and you keep the thumb out there and uh, you don't get that bad hand. Mm -hmm. You can see that thumb and he's got some padding there and he's got also a protective glove but look at the webbing. It's old, almost like a first baseman's mitt the way they can exactly. hold it. It's like a tweezer. It's a tweezer effect and that's where they catch it and so they protect their hands. They're just smarter than we were. One and two the count to Baylor. They fill up the middle. Wally Backman is almost behind second base and then they pinch the left side. Santana deep in the hole and Knight almost on the line. Not quite the shift that Ted Williams made famous but almost. Two and two to Baylor. Chopper up along third. Foul ball. Foul ball. They're playing him so much to pull that Hernandez is wide of first base. If he squids one off the end of the bat, we'll have to see some race. Yeah, Backman is maybe two steps from being directly behind second. written consent of Major League Baseball. Bottom of the ninth, 7-1 Mets. Roger McDowell trying to finish it off for Bobby Ojeda, who went seven. Three and two. When Baylor talks about keeping it going, he talks about taking quality swings. Well, he, that's the way you lead a ball club, doing exactly what he's doing. He's battling a lot of foul balls, got the count up to three and two, and hanging tough. A quality time at bat. Fouled away. Boy, he's fouled off a bunch, and Gary Carter, I think, got some dirt in his eyes behind the plate. He sure did. Mm. Those foul tips, they usually dig up that dirt, and lucky he didn't get one off the end of the finger. Especially a sinker ball, I guess, too. Oh, your fingers get chewed up so much. Uh, Jerry Grody said, and he used to catch for the Mets, said it best. He said, you could always tell when your fingers were back in good shape, you could put the toothpaste cap back on. You really get them chewed up with these sinker ballers. Back to work goes Carter. Three and two, the count to Don Baylor. NBC Miller Lite players of the game will use the world will be pitcher Bob Ojeda who did such a great game and Lenny Dykstra who had the first inning home run to get the Mets off and running 
So Miller Lite happy to present a check for $1,000 in the names of Bob Ojeda and Lenny Dykstra to the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. Gedman struck out twice and lined out to left. A hopper to second base. Backman cranks it up. And let's put it this way tonight. The wall, the green monster, did not figure in the game at all. As the Mets beat the Red Sox 7-1, we'll be back after this. Ladies and gentlemen, the Red Sox and the Kent.